Hello, I'm Jean-Philippe Courtois. Welcome to the Positive Leadership Podcast that helps you grow as an individual, as a leader, and ultimately as a global citizen. The theme of the podcast today is purpose. My next guest, Dr. Ranji Gulati, is a professor at Harvard Business School and is an expert on leadership, strategy, organizational growth, who argues that by adopting a deep purpose, leaders can create a business that possesses not just physical assets or people, but a missing element, a perceptible, energizing soul. A previous skeptic of purpose as a way to leverage growth is latest book, Deep Purpose, the heart and soul of high performance companies, provides leaders with new pathways to unlock growth using Deep Purpose as foundation. Drawing on interviews he conducted with 200 executives, he shows how embedding the purpose in a company can unleash a range of benefits, including better strategy making, highly engaged, motivated, and passionate workforce, and improved financial performance. So great to have you on the podcast. A very warm welcome, Ranjay. Jean-Philippe, pleasure to be here with you. Thank you so much for having me today. So Ranjay, in your book, you say a few things uh, that made you interested in researching and writing about purpose. I think one was teaching on the advanced management program, which, which gave you the opportunity to meet some inspirational, purpose-led leaders. But really what's interesting is that perhaps the most formative experience that influenced you the most was your mother <laughs> in her purpose-led business. So can you tell me more about that early example of a deep purpose and what you drew from that personally? Yeah. And you know, Jean-Philippe, it's interesting you asked me that question because there's a French connection in that uh, <laughs> example, actually. Okay. So, you know, my mother was uh, doing a master's degree in anthropology, um, and uh, she had her master's thesis was on tribal Indian women who hand-printed their fabric and then wore it as saris. Yeah. And so she wrote her thesis on this, and she had this idea that the same kind of printing could be used on Western women clothes. Hmm. And part of her agenda was she taught at the American school, and she wanted to show everybody that Indians, we are, even though we may be poor, we have very sophisticated aesthetic sensibility. Yeah. Anyway, she left us the school, and uh, she had this idea she was going to start a business because she thought she wanted to show the Western world how yeah. great India is, and of course help these women in the villages, but also yeah. start her own business. She needed hmm. a job. And off she went to Paris, actually, with two okay. suitcases of samples <laughs> in 1972, going door to door from fashion house to fashion house, convinced, convinced a couple of fashion houses that this was real. And that began a business. Hmm. But I saw kind of the energy in the organization very early. Hmm. And then it grew dramatically very fast to a very large a few thousand employees. And at one point she said, I want to shut this down. I feel that I've lo we've lost our soul. I never understood what she meant. Huh. I was seeing a business, and I was like, why do you want to... S no, one s no one downsizes their business on purpose, <laughs> right? You only yeah. grow it. Yes. But she couldn't master the scaling problem. Uh. And, and I kind of forgot this example. Um, yeah. But I, it, somewhere in the back of my head, it was there that, you know... And then I did a bunch of interviews of startup CEOs. And I had the same discussion with them saying, when you grow big, what do you yeah. lose in the scaling? And they would keep saying, we lose this spirit, we lose the family, we lose that intimacy, we lose that energy, entrepreneurial. Hmm. And I wrote an article then from that called The Soul of a Startup. And that was my beginning foray into the topic of purpose. Very interesting. I'm sure we'll come back to that later on the discussion around you to understand what does it take actually? to keep this light uh, up, <laughs> up <laughs> as a purpose for any business in organization that scales and grows year after year? Because I think it's a big question for many established organizations across the world. Yeah, I think this is uh, to do purpose at scale. I think you see it, mo not all, not all, but in many startups, you will see a natural kind of, we want to change the world. We yep. want to have an impact. You know, it's this kind of the storytelling. It's part of the narrative building a founder, charismatic founder, trying to build a story for the world. But I think the question is, how do you sustain it at scale? Because honestly, in a large company, if some company puts a purpose out there, the frontline worker is looking at it and saying, what is this? <laughs> What do you mean? <laughs> and, and what's in it for me as well? We'll come yeah. back again to really peel the purpose onion in, uh, in many dimensions, <laughs> Roger. Let's just start, if you don't mind, 
really about the definition, actually. I'm interested to find out about your definition of purpose and the way it's become central to your work. Because initially, I think when you began your career working and locking business potential, you said you are not that much interested in purpose, actually. <laughs> it was all about the what and the how. You are not interested in the why. So what has changed beyond your mom story, which we heard? Yeah. What else changed in your career as you, you know, as you experience different stories, people, organization or research? Well, there were several pieces that, you know, I was going to go on a sabbatical. And uh -huh. when you're thinking of a sabbatical, you're like, what am I going to do with myself? I want to do something. I don't want to just sit and watch TV or go for walks on the beach. So I'm thinking, what am I going to do? And I was trying to understand what is going on in the world around us. Mm -hmm. And there were several pieces that came together for me. Number one, I was doing some work with BlackRock and with Larry Fink and with his yep. team and his board also. And I was, you know, in that process, Larry shared his letters with me. I read the letters carefully. I, I asked him, why do you as an investor care about purpose? Hmm. And he was shaming me almost like saying, you business school people, this is a topic that is so important. But for him, it wasn't some left wing idea. It was really hmm. about businesses need to have a long term vision. Yeah. Any business need to have a long term vision. If you're an investor, what is you are in the risk business and you're trying to de-risk a business, you're looking to see if they have a long term vision. And if you're long term vision, you have to think about climate risk and community risk and all those for risks. Sure. Yep. It's part of the risk management profile mm -hmm. for any business imagining long term success. So I saw that, but, but I was still skeptical. Then I actually to something close to you again. Mm -hmm. I, I saw Microsoft's transformation story mm. and I interviewed Satya. Yeah. And along with other leaders, and Satya was like, yes, we needed a strategy, we needed an implementation plan, but we needed to have a purpose. I still didn't believe it. Mm. I had so much skepticism <laughs> because the media yeah. talks about, you know, purpose washing, yeah. uh, virtue scamming. Oh, yeah. They have all these beautiful labels, actually, for <laughs> this kind of stuff. The yeah. companies just say it. And I had my own biases, mm. but I needed to see it. And I saw it then multiple times in companies where they said, let me show you how our company has transformed itself. I saw Lego, I saw Etsy, hmm. I saw Gotham Green, I saw Livongo. Hmm. And so I'm seeing now data coming at me yeah. of companies. Yeah. And I, I had to rethink and I said, maybe in my entire career, I have missed something, hmm. an unlock into organizational potential. So it was time for you to actually dig into that and and try to learn from all those companies what happened and the magic's behind a purpose. And I think you say, uh, Ranji, businesses for a long time have run along similar operational and moral codes, such as do no harm, do no evil, and business decisions being based almost entirely on what makes commercial logic. You make a compelling case for why we need to move away from that model and move towards embracing now, as you just said, a social imperative at the core of all operational decisions. Partly because the need for change is reaching a critical point, with climate change, economic disparity, inclusion. And you also co-authored a book actually called Leading Sustainability Change <laughs> to start framing a different way of thinking about the future of capitalism. So the question is, have we reached a tipping point? And what kind of leadership is needed to truly overperform across the three dimensions of the people, the profit, and the planet? Yeah, great question. Um, and Jean-Philippe, let me try to answer this. So that, uh, there are different layers to answering this question and different companies are in different places. Yep. For some, it's a risk management exercise. <laughs> if mm -hmm. I don't do it, I'm going to get in trouble. Society has given me a license to operate. I have all these stakeholders who are much more vocal. I, it's a defensive posture. I need defensive. to do it. To I need be to in comply business. and comply, yeah. basically. Yeah. yeah, compliance. There's yes. another extreme where it's a moral principle. Hmm. You know, you have Patagonia where the founder says, it's my moral principle. I believe yeah. this is the way businesses need to operate. It's my belief system. It's an ideal for me. Hmm. And I'm going to do it whether it costs me money or doesn't cost me money. I don't care. Right? I don't want to own the business anyway. So yeah. there's a morale, uh, two extremes I'm giving you. Yeah. There's yeah. also the middle zone hmm. where you come to realize that it's good for business. Hmm that having kind of a, an anchor in which you have a more expansive understanding of value, 
yeah. is yeah. good for business. Now, the problem there is that if you say, I want to serve so many masters, <laughs> then you have to make trade-offs. Of course. Short term, long term, what do I do? Yeah. I just interviewed the CEO of Panera. Now, Panera mm. had to increase wages 25% for frontline wow. workers because the turnover was so high. Yeah. And variable comp so they can earn up to six figures if the store manager can. Hmm. But they had to raise prices 15%. So now you ask, hmm. so businesses are constantly having to, so we think of this middle zone as win-win. Yeah. If I do social value, I can also make money. Not always. No, no. Sometimes you're apportioning value. So this is the messy middle where I think businesses today have to learn to live in. That you are the slave of many masters, no longer just only. You have to serve your employees. You have to serve your customers. You have to serve your communities. You have to serve your planet. I think it takes a certain different kind of leadership who can deal with making these trade-off, hard trade-off choices with no easy answers, where every answer will make somebody upset. And you have a portfolio of things you're doing. Yeah. How do you do that? That's a very tough challenge, I guess. I can I can witness some of that in some discussion I have myself as a non-exec director in some boards, Ranje. It's hard. Yeah. It's hard. <laughs> yeah. Uh, to serve all those masters, you see, and to 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 have a, you know to have a balancing act about the way you you drive your business and you drive it for all the stakeholders. We say, you know, it reminds me of a great conversation I had actually last year on the podcast. I think with a friend of yours as well. Hubert Jolie, <laughs> you know ah, Hubert. Right? Yes, of course I know Hubert. <laughs> and uh, really? good, good discussion with Hubert about you know, his leadership principles, which are to pursue a noble purpose, uh, putting people at the center, unleash human magic, and treat profit as an outcome. <laughs> this principle that you are both talking about really serve as beacons for the next era of capitalism. So as we just discussed, I believe I think like you, capitalism needs to be somehow reshaped and we are starting to see the shift driven by ESG discussions, which are real investment, hard to have discussions to happen in a business. And you touch on some other really interesting points in your book about why we need deep purpose, especially as you put it, social institutions such as religion, extended families and civic organizations are declining as sources of meaning and identity in many people's lives. So, can you explain all those changes happening <laughs> around ourselves and explain all the tie into this bigger ID? Very big question. Wow, <laughs> uh, Jean-Philippe. Let me uh, uh, answer that at two levels. Yeah. There is a macro level, and I'll tell you why I'm coming to this, why I wrote that in the book actually, is there is criticism, purpose, the word purpose has been hijacked. Mm -hmm. Hijacked by the left wing and the right wing. The left wing says purpose of business is anything but profit. Yeah. That, and you're like, oh, really? <laughs> I mean, what kind of business are we talking about here? Yeah. And the right wing says purpose is a waste of time. Mm -hmm. If not only that, it's a distraction, it's a tax on business, and it's anti-democratic. Mm. And the argument is why should business, unelected business leaders be given the chance to reallocate capital away mm. from shareholders to social projects that they care about? Yep. They're none of their business. Yep. But what, we, what they ignore is business has a unique, there are things businesses can do that governments and agencies cannot do. Businesses are so deeply embedded in communities and society, you can't just say you make money and the government will redistribute money and we will just regulate you. It's not yeah. so simple. It's a very, I think, naive and simple-minded view. So businesses need to play a role in helping society around ESG issues, around climate issues, around complex problems. I mean, I, one of the companies I looked at was Bueller. Hmm. Bueller is a family-owned business, yeah. 150 years old. They have brought the whole food industry together because they're in the middle of the industry. And they had, I was there last year, they had <laughs> 1,100 food CEOs who together process and produce food for four billion people, more than half <laughs> the planet. Yeah. And the idea was how can we reshape the entire food industry to reduce waste? Because food is number two contributor to greenhouse gas emissions after oil and gas. So you have industry, businesses playing a role in leading this. So I want us to think about that. Now there's a different level at which we can talk about this, at the individual level. Yeah. Can an organization where you work 
give you meaning and purpose. Again, the cynical view is it's a brainwash. I want you to work <laughs> harder and I'm going to suck you into my company and make it part of your life. And yeah. that's it. You're going to be completely all over this. <laughs> and, you know, I'll tell yeah. you one. And the phrase we then use is work-life balance. Mm, I know. <laughs> what a horrible phrase. It implies that work is in opposition to life. Hmm. I get work-leisure balance. I get work-family balance. But to say work-life implies that somehow work is not living. Yes. What am I, dead at work? <laughs> and so I think, and you know, I will quote your colleague and friend, Satya Nadella, who said that yeah. I want to work in a place where people find meaning in what they do. Hmm. Or Kathleen Hogan, who says, you only work for Microsoft when Microsoft works for you. For you, yeah. And I think... We need to think, rethink our relationship with work. Hmm. And, and I think businesses have a very important role to play in allowing us to live out some of our aspirations of life through our work. I think it's so true, uh, Ranjit, and I think uh, you're right that so many organizations and you know, sometimes leadership teams are confused about the signals from their employees in terms that false sense of work-life balance <laughs> when yeah. uh, when they are not really seeking for for the core which is why do they spend all that time in their lives in that place to make what impact in their lives because all of us have one life as you as you rightly said and i think that's that's a choice that most people understand they can make every day by the way yeah. by quitting or taking another assignment or jumping on some other activities and i think Times are changing, hopefully, and uh, that's something that's, <laughs> that also gives an opportunity, I think, for organization to rethink their approach to, to the work contract. And, and, you know, it's interesting you say that because if you look at COVID, I wrote an article a few years ago called The Great Rethink. Hmm. I said it's not the great resignation, it's the great rethink. People are rethinking their lives. Yep. This whole quiet quitting or quitting the workforce or l checking out, that's a testimony to our inability to make work have meaning. And the younger generation is even more tuned into this than baby boomers and others be before that. So how can we create an environment where people are living part of their life's purpose? Not all of it, we all have bigger life purpose. Part of our life purpose through what we are doing at work. I mean, there's an old cliche story yeah. about the, the, the janitor at NASA and uh -huh. Lyndon Johnson yeah. says, what do you do here? He says, Mr. President, I'm here to put a man on the moon. How do we, <laughs> and I'll tell you why that story is telling, uh, uh, yeah. Jean-Philippe. Yeah. It elicits sense of pride. Exactly. It, el it elicits inspiration. It taps into something bigger. I'm not a transactional machine, pay for performance, or I'm not even engaged, I'm a learning machine, I wanna learn and I wanna grow. I wanna be inspired at work. I wanna feel that what I do is having an impact. I don't even mean social impact, even economic hmm. impact. Yeah. What I do is transforming the way businesses will operate. And tapping into that sense of pride elicits a whole different person showing up to work. No, I think you captured that super well. I mean, that, that sentiment of pride is so, I think it's so central to every human being in their lives and work being so central to their lives. We got to, to bring pride to people in everything they do. Now I'd like to come back, Ranji, to the other discussion we had about what does it take to scale? purpose, not just organization, as you scale the business, of course, to serve more customers, more beneficiaries and stakeholders. So truly embedding deep purpose for employees in large companies is very hard to achieve. I can relate to that myself, working alongside Satya Nadella for many years, as you mentioned him, and, and the rest of the senior leadership team and, and, and the work we try to do and keep doing, actually, over the last, oh, actually, about eight years now, transforming our company. And as we are entering a new, exciting new generative AI innovation era, well, of course, there's a lot of questions about the core purpose of the company, which remains the same, empower every person and every organization on the planet to achieve more. And what's the role of AI in that empowerment? Well, that's even more central than ever in our existence. I also had another discussion with someone you may know, uh, uh, Akhtar Bacha, who is uh, a social entrepreneur who worked for Microsoft. He used to lead our philanthropy team. He's a good friend of mine. He wrote a book a couple of years ago called The Purpose Mindset. Uh, and, and the point he makes is that the skill set you need today as a leader 
Of course, it's not about managing. The skill set you need is about synchronization. But in large companies, uh, come back to that, the message can get lost and purpose decays exponentially as it grows, as you go on through five, six, seven layers of managers. And no offense to the manager, but those are great people. <laughs> so what advice can you give to our listeners about how you go about synchronizing people's desires and purpose? Or do you build that emotional connection all the way through the organization, not just from the top to the bottom, but also, I believe, bottom up, actually. And that's, that's hard. How do you do that? So I'm going to have to describe six chapters of my book to you in answering this question. <laughs> so let me try. Yeah. Uh, let me give it a try. But I, I want to start, first of all, I came to learn one thing. Purpose is not a purpose statement. Hmm. We get confused with the words. Oh, it's one line. I want to empower the world to make a difference. It's not that. The words are there because they are distillation of an ideal. Yeah. And but there's meaning behind those words. It's how companies use those words. Mm -hmm. So it starts with what I call discovery. And I learned one thing interesting at Lego and the Indian company Mahindra. Mm -hmm. Both of them said we had to detect our purpose. We had to discover it was there. Yeah. It's not like we had to invent it. Now a startup will have to invent a purpose, but in an established company or in yeah. some cases you have to revive your purpose. You know yeah. Johnson and Johnson had to revive their credo. Microsoft had to refresh their purpose. Yep. You already had one. So it's, but it's more than words. Yes. Then you have to kind of disseminate it. And it's not some change management exercise saying, no. please read our new purpose statement, you know, and that goes nowhere. How do you tell it as a story? How do you communicate and connect it to people's personal ambitions? That becomes important. Then the question becomes, okay, how do I then really rewire my organization, put it into my strategy, structure, process, people, culture? How do yeah. I connect it in there? I'm putting my purpose to work. I got to really take it into the DNA. EY created KPIs. Hmm. They said, we're going to measure. We can't measure the people on purpose hmm. because purpose is one line. But yep. purpose translates into four dimensions of value. Hmm. We're going to measure everybody on these four dimensions of value. And that's what's going to happen. But all this still doesn't work. Hmm. You know, this is, you know, you still got all these hard levers, soft levers, the 7S frame, whatever you want to call it. Yeah, yeah. You need to somehow bring it alive. And I think, you know, there was a late colleague of mine from Stanford, Jim March, who said leaders have to be poets and plumbers. Hmm. Love the combination. You can get the plumbing, <laughs> but you've yeah. got to have the poetry because poetry brings magic. Plumbing hmm. brings logic. How do you connect these two together into the organization and, and take it to the front line? And yeah. I'll give you an example to illustrate. So GE Aviation did this, which is mm -hmm. the, the last surviving yep. crown jewels of GE. Mm -hmm. They launched a campaign about, I don't know, more than 10 years ago called We Reinvent Flight and Bring People Home Safely. And the idea was that more than half of all airplanes flying in the world at any time are flying with a GE engine. So how do I remind the frontline worker that what you do is bringing somebody home safely? Mm -hmm. We lose that connection. It gets abstracted. So that's another piece of it. But even then, it doesn't fully work. I found some companies saying, including yours, yeah. that how can you get somebody to buy into company purpose when they don't know their own life purpose? Yeah. We That's need to awaken, question. most of us yeah. don't think about our life purpose. Who yeah, thinks yeah. about, very <laughs> few people think about their life's purpose. So I started to see companies saying, no, we need to awaken personal life purpose yeah. before we can connect you to some company purpose. And you see that Unilever has done that, yeah. uh, Microsoft did it, um, uh, KPMG, and a bunch of other companies. Uh, uh, BlackRock has done it. How do I get people to think about their own purpose? And it makes you more resonant or receptive if it now if you get it right to your earlier we have another buzzword in business alignment we want everyone to be aligned I know. more than ever alignment purpose yes. <laughs> is a wonderful tool for alignment yes so 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 many great insights uh, Ranji. i know you have so much to tell about that uh, and what you just what you just said about i mean that ability that uh, leaders companies can have to establish a real deep connection between uh, every employee's raison d'être, every employee's yeah. inner purpose, to the, to the company's purpose, 
is is amazing and that's something at least we've tried and we keep practicing at microsoft is the way we we believe our company is a platform to empower our, our people's potential and each one of them at the end of the day of course need to define with clarity the way they, they think about their purpose and the way they see that the company uh, can contribute to that purpose that self-fulfillment and i think you can go all across the company 220,000 people in your role in a company from uh, you know from people in engineering team to support functions to frontline people they will have a story to tell about the way they think they can contribute to a bigger purpose uh, with the organization but i think it's it's a lot of ongoing work and <laughs> reinforcement you have to do uh, particularly in the toughest moments as well, because we all know that, you know, businesses have ups and downs. And this is when I think both the culture, the purpose can be challenged and you want to, to stay on track and, and, and keep it alive. So let's continue on, on, um, on that great discussion. You briefly mentioned something that's very important because I know as, uh, you know, uh, certainly a, a thought uh, leader in terms of business leadership, You've been challenged. We are together actually in one, uh, in one panel on purpose in the Peter Drucker forum a year ago. <laughs> and I remember one of your colleagues, I would, not, I, would not, I would not name him, said, hey, tell me more about the way you measure purpose, right? What are the, what are the KPIs? Do you have any KPIs actually? Do you have some hard facts <laughs> to measure that stuff? Uh, so you just mentioned briefly EY, but I, I'm sure you, I know you've been studying and and look at some evidence. <coughs> can you tell us about the way you can actually measure over time the purpose and the impact you are having with the purpose across your business and your company? So there's two, uh, depending on who's doing the measuring and for what purpose, <laughs> right? <coughs> Excuse me. Yeah. <coughs> it depends on who's doing the measuring and for what purpose. So let's think about companies doing it just to track their own progress. That was the mm -hmm. EY story. Yeah. So Carmine DiCibio, the CEO of uh, yeah. um, EY, said to me, he said, look, we can't measure purpose in terms of you know, building a better working world. I mean, what am I going to measure? Uh, and he said, we're accountants. We know how to measure. So he says, well, that's why we do it. And he said, look, we, we realize that to build a better working world, we have to measure how we create value. Mm. So we create financial value. We create employee value, mm -hmm. we create social value, you know, we create so a customer value. How do we think about these? Yeah. So we're going to measure things that are byproducts or outcomes of our purpose. If we're living our purpose, we should be delivering on all those four dimensions of value. Yeah. So they're indirect. So no one measured purpose directly, like how alive is the purpose in the company today. It's more about each of employee, are we delivering on the promises that emanate from our purpose? Hmm. So that's what I've seen most companies doing. Companies do, yeah. yeah. Right? Now, academics are into this as well now. We want to be able to measure company purpose and correlate to performance and say companies with, like ESG. Yep. The problem is ESG purpose, these are very touchy-feely. In fact, in ESG, S is the, me the messy measure. How do you measure S? You can measure E now, you can measure G also more or less, but S is a mess. So, you know, we have the same issue with purpose. So companies start to say, I'm going to use, you know, machine learning, natural language processing, and look at companies' annual reports. How often do they mention purpose in their annual yeah. report, <clears throat> analyst call, but though, or media coverage? But those are self-representations. Hmm. That is not really, it's telling me how often does a company, if somebody has a great PR team that says, we've got to talk about purpose, you're going to get a very high purpose score. So, but people are using those. Then others are using uh, serve employee surveys like great places to work yeah. and saying, well, imp if employees feel energized and motivated and inspired, they must be because they have a purpose. But there are other reasons why a company employees can be happy as well, yeah. right? The company's doing well, they pay me well, you know, they have good benefits and everything is great. So I think academics and consulting firms also who are trying to portray and show that purpose is good or bad for business mm. are struggling with how do we measure that purpose index so we can give provide people some large sample evidence that does it really matter and you know my book is called deep purpose for a reason mm. because i saw a lot of superficial purpose yeah you know sure. and i don't think and so people ask me this also how do you know if companies doing deep purpose or shallow purpose yeah that's the hunt I think we're on. 
No, I agree with you. I think I think I think we're still in the infancy stage, Ranji, honestly, of measuring purpose. My my my, my deep belief. I think as as the business world really uh, figures out what ESG means in terms of the direct connection to a business mission with its positive impacts and also, of course, cutting negative externalities on environment, social, all the people that you work with or through your supply chain and so on and so forth and governance, I think there will be some interesting I believe findings in doing that in a good way, and I believe. Well, this is maybe my face in, 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 uh, and optimism in capitalism. There will be anyway a lot of correction, the cost correction in terms of that equilibrium between, of course, the financial performance and those ESG kind of track records as well. And last comment I would make: It's interesting. In my home country, you may know or not, there's a. There's actually a, a, a legal regime now for enterprise in France called entreprise à mission, yeah. mission-led, purpose-led enterprise. It's been going on for two years now. We have now about a thousand companies, including large companies like Danone and a few others, so pretty large ones. And, and of course, there's still a lot of skepticism in terms, how do you guys measure that? So I was having a discussion the other day with uh, Pierre Dubic is the CEO of a, of a learning platform called Open Classroom. Is a mission-led company, and and I was really going to details in their mission report, which is what you are supposed to publish when you're a mission company. And in this case, this company is all about making education accessible to all. So what is decided to do as a business was to explicitly make a clear choice of locating their financial resources in serving for free or super low cost the most underserved people across the world, not just in France, actually, to have access to skills and jobs. And they are measuring that by categories across the world. And I found that interesting as a way to at least be super clear and super transparent on what you want to achieve. So anyway, I think more, more yeah. to find in this. <laughs> <laughs> it's a great. It's a. You know what I think is w w what you're describing, though, Jean Philippe, is that there is an interesting intersection between in businesses that are trying to reimagine the footprint of business. Yeah. That you know, and, and, and asking our very purpose should have a social component to it. And the question that arises there is: Is it a tax on shareholders, or is it a win-win for shareholders? Yeah. How do we c reconcile that? And I think this is the part that, and I think is, some of us would like to say it's good for business. It's win-win, right? Others say, well, even if it right. isn't win-win, you have to do it, yeah. right? How do we explain that to the different parts of the communities we're operating? But I really like this because I think is what is happening is some leaders are saying, like Emmanuel Faber at Danone, mm -hmm. when he did that, I actually interviewed him at that time, mm -hmm. and his point was that I wanna make sure this is baked into our commitment. We're yeah. making a commitment, public commitment, right? A, you know, and how do we hold ourselves to that commitment? Um, I looked at Viva. Yeah, Viva is the first company to uh, be a public benefit corporation mm. Mm. Uh, to relist itself from being a regular C corp to being a public. And I think yep. there's a threshold: over ninety percent of shareholders of the public mm. company had to vote that we are relisting. Yeah. And because in the fiduciary, for the board of directors. It says you are not only here to serve shareholders. Yes. <laughs> right? Now, the founder is still there and the co-founder is still involved. And they use their own personal conviction. But they're highly profitable. Yeah. So they want to show that, you know, we, you can be good and do good. Um, I think there's a larger social compact between business and society. Absolutely. The challenge here, I would add, last thing I'll say is yeah. there's enough cynics out there. Oh yeah. Even if you, you know who say that some some companies Plenty. only yeah. do this for posturing. Yeah. PR. And they yep. give everybody a bad rap, you know, ESG yep. consultants yep. who are trying to improve your ESG scores yep. so you yep. can be on the right lists to be <laughs> investors can pick up on your fund. So there's a lot of kind of scamming of the system that creates negativity and noise. And yeah. I think we need to find a way to transcend that. 100% agree with you, Ranjay. Now, I'd like to talk about the, the four pathways that you describe in your book, right, uh, that show you it was possible to leverage purpose in large companies. You talked about direction, motivation, 
reputational and relational. So can you elaborate on those four pathways and give maybe give us some examples of how you saw them work in the companies you, you've, been, you've been looking at? So this goes back to your earlier question. I yep. was struggling to with conviction say purpose is good for business financial mm -hmm. business and I had no me metrics and ways yep. so I started asking people is it really good for business and I one gentleman Thomas Toon Anderson the chairman of Orsted told me he said mm -hmm. I pity those who think of purpose coming at the expense of performance mm -hmm. I pity them and I said, but explain to me how is it good for business? And this is these four dimensions came out of a year of asking people this oh, question. Yeah. So the first one is directional. Hmm. And the argument there is, in today's times, business is chaotic. You are managing different stakeholders. You are optimizing from one to the other, as we were yep. discussing earlier. Yep. Purpose doesn't answer this multivariate optimization problem, but it gives you a framework to think about it. It gives you some guardrails in yeah. which you can say, okay, mm -hmm. what do I do? What should we do? Okay, what does that purpose tell us to do? Okay, let's think about it. That gives you clarity. And number of companies, the old Johnson & Johnson during Tylenol crisis, mm -hmm. when the CEO had to make a decision to pull the product, he said, our credo gave us the answer in a minute. Mm -hmm. So we didn't have to think at all about it. So companies reference and lean into their purpose to give them guidance in these times, directional clarity. Directional. It also creates alignment in the organization. Mm. Why are we here? Mm. The second one is motivational. Mm. In one study that came out in HBR in 2015, inspired workers are more than twice as productive as satisfied workers. Mm. Unlocking human potential. Human magic, as Hubert would as say. Human right? magic, as Hubert would <laughs> like to say. Right, exactly. Yeah. The third one yeah. is relational. Hmm. I never thought of this one, but I found companies that ha when they have a strong purpose attract alliance ecosystem partners because there's trust, there's more clarity, more transparency. So people are resonant saying that company has a purpose, they really mean it, There's I know it's real, I think we can trust them. Trust. And the last one is customers, hmm. reputational. Hmm. Customers also seem to care. Purpose branding is a hot ticket. And so much research showing that, you know, even at Unilever, they found they've actually t categorized their brands as purpose or not purpose. The mm -hmm. purpose brands are growing much faster, faster than the yeah. other brands. <laughs> so as Alan Jope would tell you. So, you know, you start to see that there is some evidence, emerging evidence, that purpose can be good. But I have to say, deep purpose, not yeah. just a purpose statement. So, I mean, so insightful again, uh, Ranjay, uh, and, and using that framework of those uh, four pillars uh, to think about. You know, so much we've been, we've been talking about correlates with positive leadership, which, as you know, is my mm -hmm. philosophy. <laughs> it's essential for leaders to start by finding personal purpose and inspiration and then focus on connecting with people, creating that relation that you are talking about and connecting others to purpose and meaning in a ripple effect. But a big part of the puzzle is getting employees to really engage with organizational purpose that we discussed as well together. How do you do that at a company and enterprise-wide level? Celebrating also encouraging individuality is one of the keys of firing up interesting motivation. You actually wrote a case study on Pete Carroll, you mentioned him before, who had a pleasure interviewing as well my podcast. <laughs> so what did you learn uh, from studying Pete's philosophy about how to create a space for individual to thrive and how to really unleash that human potential. You know, it's really interesting. Um, there are so many versions of what has happened with work life. We created this kind of, if you look at the economic model of organizations, mm -hmm. when economists model and study organizations, they describe them as a nexus of contracts that everybody's in a contract with every with the organization to ex, uh, quid pro quo. But the, what a horrible phrase, I think. <laughs> because it implies that it's an entirely transactional undertaking. Yes. And then what we like to believe behind that is that human beings, we are rational creatures who happen to have some emotional noise around us. <laughs> right? We're basically rational, transactional people, but we have some emotions that come in the way once in a while we have feelings, and so we get upset. <laughs> I think human beings, we are emotional creatures who rationalize everything. Absolutely. And, you know, we have to remind ourselves that organization is a human enterprise. Hmm. 
It's human beings coming together towards a common cause. Your own countryman, Emil Durkheim, long mm. time ago, sociologist, yes. once said, he talked about a moral community, mm. people coming together around a shared ideal. Mm. And when people come together around a shared ideal, they unleash tremendous potential from themselves. Now, Pete Carroll is trying to do that with a sports team, saying, yeah. I'm going to get these players because think about it. And Pete's model is not that different from the Marine Corps. I did a case on the Marine Corps also. You see, the starting baseline is I'm playing for myself. Hmm. I want to get famous. I want to get rich. If I play well, other comp teams will want me. I will do better. So I'm driven by my individual ambition. Yeah. Right? That's one level. Mm -hmm. Then the next level emerges where I'm so connected to my teammates. Mm. I do it for my teammates. I am so co committed to them. Yep. I'm fighting for them. The third level, I am committed to my organization. Semper Fidelis, mm. the Marine Corps. I cannot let my organization down. down yeah. Another level, I'm doing it for my coach, whom I admire, I respect. Mm. He cares about me. He, I be, he believes in me. He's given me confidence. I need to show him I can do it. Hmm. Now think about it. Which one brings out the most in us? Just hmm. doing it for myself? Or doing it for my teammates? Doing it from an organization that I'm really proud of? Or doing it even for my coach? Yeah. Unlocking human potential. I think this idea that we're all just transactional human beings involved in transactions, well, I think what a shallow view. I think it's a nexus of commitments. Yeah, and I think, and I think, uh, you know, people organization feel that emotion flowing now. I think everywhere, and and, and I think that it's just kind of irresistible now. <laughs> and and organization have not to deal with it, but actually as to to work with it, as to embed that feeling at the core of the relationship with their people and their customers every single day, single moment. And, and this is why companies struggle with scaling, because they feel they lose yeah. that spirit of connection and belonging and feeling. And, and then you have consulting firms that will sell you, for a fee, founder mindset. <laughs> yes. And say, I will t make everybody feel like a founder in the company. They all need to feel like owners. I'm going <laughs> to infuse that. But it's really not so easy to just have a campaign and say, from tomorrow, we all feel like owners. I'm going to give you an uh, employee share on a plan, ESOP. And from there on, you should all feel like owners of the company. These things don't connect. No. How do we relate to human beings? You look at the other person as a human being with aspirations, with ambitions, with feelings. Yeah, so, so Ranjay, building on that, actually, um, as we talk about human beings, obviously, giving people autonomy and a chance to be their own authentic self could, for some leaders, feel like a step too far, I mean, as we discussed, into uncharted territory giving away too much control. However, research, and I've been part of that, suggests that autonomy does motivate and engage employees. So can you talk to us about that key principle of providing a framework for increased autonomy and how it benefits companies and organizations at large? Yeah. So actually, this uh, work uh, of mine on autonomy came out of a study I did at Alaska Airlines in Seattle. Ah. Yeah, <laughs> And Ben Minicucci, the CEO, was a former student of mine. And, um, and you know, they were trying to empower their frontline workers to have more discretion to serve customers. Yeah. So, you know, waiving fees or giving an upgrade or delaying the flight. Yeah. And it was amazing when they began, first of all, the frontline said, I don't want it. Keep it. <laughs> I want to do rules. I want to buy the book. This yeah. thinking too much and then I have to explain why I chose to do this. N I don't want it. <laughs> yeah. The, the middle managers who said, don't give it, don't give it. Why are you doing that? <laughs> That's crazy, yeah. right? So it's like, it sounds really good in theory, but in practice, it's not so straightforward. And, you know, I had to lean into the research on parenting styles, actually, by mm. a, a Diane Baumrind is a scholar yep. who studies optimal parenting. And her idea is freedom within a framework. Mm. You need to provide guardrails. You yeah. know, you can't do Zappos which was a un you know freedom with no framework you know then it can become chaotic yeah so how do you create but then the question is how do you define the framework yeah now i'm going to get a little religious here but if you look at the bible and you look at the edicts of the bible the biblical mm -hmm. edicts mm -hmm. they have two kinds of edicts thou shalt and thou shalt not mm. 
we don't only think of, what happens is when we think of framework, we only think of thou shalt not. Yeah, but what about thou shalt? <laughs> thou shalt, so you know, how do you create, so I wrote an article called Structures That Don't Stifle. Hmm. I wanted to call it Freedom Within a Framework uh, that is in the Harvard Business Review, where I talk about how companies like not just Alaska, others, are successfully trying to empower by creating freedom within a framework. Now, back to purpose. Purpose is one type of a framework. Yes. Culture is another type of framework. Absolutely. Right? Rules are another type of framework. So we have to think of a kind of an integrated way of thinking of what are the elements of our framework that hold things together. And the frontline worker then feels trusted. Right? They feel, uh, you know, I'll tell you a story from the late Jack Welsh. Hmm. He used to come to my class. And he told me one incident that really moved him and had a huge effect on him as a leader. He was CEO already, and he had mm -hmm. gone to a retirement party for people who had worked at GE for 50 years. Yep, yep. And so he was there at a retirement party, and he's talking to people, and one of these guys who was a frontline factory worker comes up to yep. Jack, he says, I have waited my whole life to talk to you. <laughs> so Jack says, what, is, what about? <laughs> he says, you know, all my life, you, ha you paid for my hands. You could have had my head and heart for free, huh. but you never asked. Wow, <laughs> that's a powerful. <laughs> yeah. And obviously we don't know what Jack said in response to that. <laughs> but it's, he was uh, stunned. Jack is rarely <laughs> speechless, uh, or Jack was rarely speechless, I'm but sure, he said I'm he sure was, was absolutely stunned. I'm sure he was stunned. You know, w wonderful example. And... Talking about this long-lasting change and staying true to company purpose and DNA is, is a huge challenge, as we discussed, Ranji. It's easy to let purpose fall to the wayside when you get external pressures. And when a company's purpose-led leader leaves a company to be also replaced by another CEO. So I'd like you to comment as well on the companies you studied where, in a way, the purpose becomes so associated with the founder or CEO that when the next person, the next leader, came in, everything fell apart, <laughs> which is, I think, what you call the personification paradox. So how do you deal with that? It's a great question. There's two parts to your question. I should Let me try to answer yeah. the personification paradox yes. part first. Uh, you see... In a lot of cases, purpose gets imbued in an individual who becomes mm. larger than life, right? Either they are founder CEOs, but even successful CEOs, yep. right? Who've been there, become yep. legendary leaders, yep. like your CEO is a legendary leader now, right? Mm -hmm. yep. And it's anyway hard for organizations to adjust when these leaders kind of move and go, somebody else comes in, and the next person has a very hard job. Yes. And so I think those leaders have to do a very deliberate job in succession in terms of how they help people recognize that the purpose is not tied to their persona. Mm. It's not a manifestation of them. They are not the carrier of purpose. The purpose is tied to the institution. Mm. Johnson & Johnson did that very well, where the credo belongs to Johnson & Johnson, not to General Johnson. It belongs to the organization. And I want to share with you an anecdote I heard from somebody at Apple. Hmm. So when Steve Jobs was going, knew he was passing away soon, he hired two of my colleagues hmm. uh, from HBS. Yeah. And he wanted them to write cases about key decisions Apple had made under him hmm. to capture the essence of Apple. And the reason for that, he said, was when he was on the board of Disney because of the Pixar yeah. acquisition. Yeah, Pixar. Yeah, yeah. And what frustrated him all the time was every decision they had to make the Pixar board, somebody would say, what would Walt have done if he was here? <laughs> and and it, drove, it drove him crazy, saying, crazy. Walt isn't here. Yeah. Walt died like 70 years ago. <laughs> the world has changed. And yeah. his worry was that when he passed, people would say, what would Steve have done? Hmm. And he said, it's not about Steve, it's about Apple. Hmm. There's an essence to Apple. So how do you now transmit? Transmit that. Yeah, and you know, human beings, we have a need Indeed. to connect ideas to people. We yeah. are, we, we need a human figure. So that's yeah. the first part. How do you mm. con pass, transmit it out of you to the in institution, yeah. make it decoupled? Yeah. The other question mm -hmm. you asked was about purpose and performance. Mm. Very important question. Some companies yeah. who are not performing well 
will hide behind their purpose, saying, we're, we're doing our purpose, <laughs> and so we need a little break yeah. on the financial returns. No way. Right? <laughs> and I want to go back to the late yes. Peter Drucker. Peter mm. Drucker said, profit is like oxygen. Without mm. it, you're dead. Yeah. But you don't live just to breathe. Mm. What a horrible thing to do if you're living only to <laughs> breathe. So how do you reconcile? Because mm. remember, shareholders are also risking their hard-earned capital Gross. for you. Yeah. So this is a challenge. And again, purpose encompasses profit. So there's, I think that there's a, we're confusing purpose with social purpose. Yeah, it's true. Mm-hmm. So we have to be clear that, okay, fine, there's commercial mm-hmm. goals and social goals of enterprises. We have to deliver on both. And, and I think companies that are smart understand that. You cannot say, no ret- financial return, but I'm driving social return. Yeah, yeah. You know, or wait. Um, and I think we have to un- accept, and business leaders need to recognize that, you know? Yeah. How do we deal with this? Yeah. Uh, so one of the ways maybe, if, if I may, and I think it's some, something obviously you've been writing about, Ranjay, to go and, and deal with this challenge again of a founder or CEO, legendary CEO leaving a company, is the way uh, an organization can empower its people to tell the story one person at a time. The story of the mission, the story of their fulfillment in what they do. So how do you teach that very important, I found, art of storytelling, again, enterprise-wide, to all employees? Because I found it so, not just inspirational, but actually so critical to hear from people from the front line, not just from the tops, their own personal stories about what that mission means in their lives. And this is always something that has been touching me the most, is getting notes or you know, personal conversations across the world in, I don't know, 110 countries visited for Microsoft, of people telling me their own stories about their missions <laughs> and, the way, and what it means for them. So how, but how, do you, how do you do that at scale? <laughs> you know, first of all, I think you touch on a very important point. Storytelling is a powerful way to communicate ideas, but it's also a powerful way to connect to other people. Yeah. I can't tell you, you know, I am a, my tendency is to be a very private person. Mm. So when I was writing this book, I did not want to include that my mother in the book. Your mother's you know? story, yeah. I didn't want to, <laughs> I just, but finally I thought, okay, fine, it is an important part of me, so why should I be shy? Mm. I can't tell you how many people, st- they say, I don't know if I, I didn't read your book, but I read the mother's story. I love this mother story. I'm like, really read the rest of the book, please. <laughs> people want to know you and you. how, what is yeah. your story? Yeah. Now, how do we, and I think it's a powerful way to communicate ideas. Mm-hmm. Indra Nui at Pepsi, when she talked about performance with purpose, she started by talking about growing up in a poor household in India where there was no water and water came in the morning for 15 minutes mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. they had four buckets of water. Yeah. And that was starting point so, to connect. So purpose has ideas in it. Pur- uh, stories have ideas in it. Stories have connection in it. Now, how do you do it at scale? This is very hard. I know that your company has a, uh, I- uh, using technology, you have a platform where people can tell their story. You have storytellers <laughs> who help them tell their story. <laughs> but I'll give you a simple example. At KPMG, yeah. they did one thing. Mm-hmm. They made every leader on an index card Write uh-huh. down, why do I come to work? Hmm. And they had to put it outside on the wall. On the wall. Hmm. And most of them said, uh, like, I come to work to support my family and myself. Yeah. But the next reason, the next two, three reasons were interesting. And they also discovered that more than half of the partners are first generation in family to go to college. Hmm. Accounting was a safe profession yeah. to be <laughs> able there. So you're doing it to s- you support your f- extended family. So you learn a lot about each other. It creates human connection. It creates meaning, um, and it communicates ideas. All every religious tradition is communicated through storytelling. Storytelling is one of the most powerful vehicles. Um, I think it's hugely important, and I can share with you. There's a professor at the Kennedy School who has this yeah. idea of three elements of a great story. Uh huh. What is it? <laughs> he said the three elements, and he's a, a community activist. Yeah. political organizer. So yeah. he studies how do activists mobilize people through storytelling. Hmm. And it's in the book, actually, and I talk about three things. He says, self, yeah. you have to be in the story. Us, why do Us. we need to be together? together. Now. 
No, the urgency. Self, yeah. us, now. No. Great framework. And so talking about that, do you think, and I'm, I'm going to really push the envelope a bit, that organizations, leaders, again, can and, and could inspire people and teams to a point that they leave their jobs as a calling, as a calling, and calling has a big meaning, as you know, <laughs> religious as well, uh, or vocational. So do you think that's possible? Have you seen that? And do you think that's actually uh, the right thing to do? So let me, uh, you, you mean, are you saying how can employees be see their work as a calling? View yeah, their job as a calling? Yeah, okay. and do you think this is something that actually leadership management need to think about? Or is it something that is coming as a natural result of a really it's, live mission and purpose? And the fact of the matter is some of the people see that as a calling. Or is that too extreme? Hugely, <laughs> hugely important question, Jean Philippe. Hugely yeah. important question. And there's research actually by uh, two professors, one at Michigan, one at Yale, mm -hmm. on an area of work called job crafting. Mm. And they came up with this taxonomy that human beings have one of three orientations towards work. My work is a job, I do it for yep. money. My work is a career, I do it to get ahead. And the third one is my work is a calling, I do it because it means something to me. Yes. And they tested this idea in a hospital in New York. Hmm. And the expectation was physicians would say my work is a calling, and janitors would say my work is a job. The physician number came in one third, one third, one third, which is what they yep. expected. Yep. The janitor number came in one third, one third, one third. Hmm. Then the question was, who are these janitors who are saying my work is a calling? Yeah. And so they went and interviewed the janitors and said, oh, I don't come here to clean. I get to help people. People are very hmm. sick. They're vulnerable. They're so hmm. grateful. I get to make a difference. The yeah. smallest of things I do, now only one third are operating this way. And their yeah. job satisfaction was out of the roof. Their Super absenteeism high. was low. Gross. Now, this is spontaneous behavior. The yes. research then leads us to ask the question, can we create an environment where people experience what they do as a calling? Yeah. They feel inspired. They feel connected. You know, human beings, if you look at purpose, the word purpose at the individual level, it is a stable and generalized intention hmm. to do something that is meaningful to the self and yeah, consequential and to the world beyond the self. Yes. All of us deep down hold on to this hero complex. We yes. all want to have an impact on the world beyond ourselves. I think what you said is a, is a perfect almost conclusion before my last question, Ranjay, <laughs> on, again, what's at the core of positive leadership, which is about the way you extend your personal mission to embark with others to have a positive impact in the world, which is the third circle of that, of that development you have and that sense of calling and, and mission you have. And so I'd like to ask you, which is a more personal question, you started to open up, of course, is your book and your mom. <laughs> and I'd like to ask you, in a way, what would you like your legacy to be? I mean, given everything you've done and you keep doing and you're researching on the soul of organization and you're getting to the core of human beings <laughs> in this discussion, What's going to be your legacy and what, what, what are you really extremely passionate about around you, transmitting or sharing or giving back to others? Yeah. You know, I thank you for that question. You know, first of all, I deeply resonate with the purpose of my employer, which is we educate leaders who make a difference in the world. Hmm. That is very connected to me, yeah. uh, to how I see myself. I see two parts to it. The first part is I help organizations unlock their potential. Organizations is where most of us live our lives. We earn our livelihood. We do work. If I can help organizations create a more humane context in which people experience work differently, I feel I will have accomplished one part of my life purpose. But there's another part of my life purpose also, which has to do with my students. Mm -hmm. I feel my job as an educator is not just to provide, transmit knowledge. My job is to unlock human potential. My job is to help them discover what is that difference that they can make in the world. It is through them that I feel I can help make a small difference in the world around me. And then, of course, there's family and community and society yeah. that also, but around me, I feel if I can help unlock possibility, 
around me, I feel I will have lived my life's purpose. And I'm sure that around you, you have so many great uh, stories of your students from 10 years ago, five years ago, who are probably giving you so much gratification in your daily lives. I, I know yeah. this is probably the, the best way for all of us to, yeah. to, get, uh, to get a meaning is uh, when you get people telling you, hey, what you did a few years ago, that, that really helped me finding that meaning in my life or that helped me achieving that. So I'm sure that's something that <laughs> also rings to your two ears, Ranji. Thank you so much, Ranji. It's been a wonderful dialogue, uh, really warm thanks, and looking forward to, to pursue your dialogue in different circles, different places in the world. Yeah. Thank you so much, Jean-Philippe. That was really a pleasure. You really got me to think, and I had to think very <laughs> hard, so I really appreciate the opportunity. And I love the theme of your podcast, you know. I think we all need to think of leadership in a different way. Yeah. And so I am really grateful that you are doing this for all of us. So thank you. Thanks so much, Roger.